Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, got it. Yeah, <laughs> great. Perfect. Okay, Standard. recording. Okay, uh, Nicholas Tradell, how are you today? Uh, I'm good. Yes, and you yourself? Uh, I, I'm doing quite well. It's so it's good. about uh, it's a little after six a.m. here. And My it's goodness, a little, yes, it's a little late here. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. I see you have many books in the background, so you're I, an I avid do. reader. Yeah. yeah, yes, I, I am indeed. Yes, yeah, <laughs> all over the house, in fact, and uh, a certain creative disorder up here in the in my bedroom. <laughs> so the way I like to think of it, uh, controlled chaos. Then it, it, that's the way to look at it. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so we met in uh, 2018 at the Colin Wilson conference. That's correct. Yes. Yes, and, indeed. And you were a speaker there. That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how did you get involved in that uh, in that uh, venue, and uh, what's your interest in Colin Wilson? I'd been interested in Colin Wilson's work since uh, I w since my early teens. In fact, uh, I encountered his first book called The Outsider, which was a philosophical book, and also his uh, first novel called Ritual in the Dark, which is in fact about a a serial killer, so you can perhaps see a certain link to my interest in in cold blood in in that respect. And it was a book that Wilson himself was very interested in. And it, likewise for me, so it's a, a lot of that in criminology. So sure. it's, it's what started the podcast and the effort. So there's a connection yeah. in there. Yes. And yes. you have uh, a well. Before we go into that, maybe just a little bit of background. Um, so in cold blood was written by truman capote that's right yes um and uh tell us a little bit about the book and then the story behind it capote had established himself very successfully as a novelist a short story writer and a journalist but he was looking for a new project and he saw this item in the new york times um mm -hmm. a family of three that had been slain in uh Holcomb in Kansas, and he thought this would be a, a, an interesting topic, perhaps initially for an article. So he went down there in the aftermath of the murder. He took with him his uh, childhood friend, uh, Nell Harper Lee, who was about to become famous with the novel To Kill a Mockingbird. And so huh? they went down there and he uh, they began researching it together, and um, Harper Lee was probably very helpful to him in that uh, respect, though both of them, because they'd come from a very small town in Alabama, they'd grown up there, they knew what small town life was like. And mm -hmm. it's worth saying, because it's interesting in relation to what then happened, is that initially, of course, the idea was from the KBI, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, that mm -hmm. the murder had been uh, committed by somebody local. That was the notion. Mm -hmm. so when they first went down, there was a great deal of uneasiness and fear and suspicion in the town as mm -hmm. to who had committed the murders. It, it turned out, of course, to be somebody from far away, and that made a great deal of difference to the way then the whole book proceeded. What was mm -hmm. crucial is that, um, that a long delay ensued after the conviction and of the murderers before the sentence was carried out. We're looking mm -hmm. at a murder that took place late in 1959. The executions mm -hmm. weren't carried out until the mid 60s. Right. And so in that period, um, Capote got to know the killers very well. And mm -hmm. so quite a lot of the material, uh, it comes from his later conversations with him, what they told him and what in particular, what one of them, Perry Smith, told him about the murders. And there was this rather, grim sense that Capote couldn't really finish the book until Dick and Perry had been executed, had been hanged. That that made his good ending. So it, it created a very complex uh, situation, as you can imagine. So that's that's the story of the, the, the book. There's a lot more to say about it, but that's how it, it happened. It was almost in a way by accident. If, mm -hmm. if these murders had taken place and Capote hadn't come along, they would have certainly had a, a grim place in the annals of true crime, but they wouldn't have achieved anything like the prominence they achieved when Capote was already a well-established literary figure, uh -huh. turned his attention to it. 
Mm-hmm. And they were not by the when he had gone down there to investigate the case, they had not been captured yet, right? They they were captured no. while he was there. Absolutely. When when he first went down there, there was still the idea that this was an inside job that someone local had done it. Mm-hmm. But the Clutter family were, were highly respected in the community, but it's also fair to say they aroused in some quarters a certain amount of envy and resentment. Mm-hmm. So there was a feeling that, that it was a local job, mm-hmm. and it wasn't until the remarkable coincidence of. Uh, a convict called Floyd Wells, who had been sh- once shared a cell with Dick, hearing about the murder on the radio and remembering that when they'd, when they'd been selling together, he had told Dick about this wealthy farmer, Herbert Clutter, for whom he worked, who uh, Floyd Wells believed had a, a great deal of, of money. If uh, mm-hmm. Floyd Wells had been elsewhere or hadn't been listening to that radio broadcaster and died earlier, it's mm-hmm. quite possible that the link would never have been made simply because they came from so far outside the, the community. They weren't mm-hmm. a part of it as has originally been suspected. So the, the, the KBI investigation went in quite a different direction to, to what had originally been expected. And it's always worth, I think, remembering that, that as they say, when Capote and Harper Lee first went down there, the, the idea was that somebody local was the most likely suspect. Indeed, they suspected for a time mm-hmm. Bobby Rupp, who was uh, uh, Nancy Clutter's uh, boyfriend. They thought he mm-hmm. had, might have done it. And mm-hmm. there was that uh, atmosphere. But they did, of course, then come from a long, long way away. And without Floyd Wells, the connection might never have been made. Mm-hmm. And uh, Perry had Perry uh, Smith and Richard Hickok yeah. had mis- misconstrued uh, that they ha- they were st- that the Clutter family spent some ten thousand dollars a year on the farm. They misconstrued that as they have ten thousand dollars at the farm. Uh, I, I, so- yeah. Uh, yes, so uh, you have written a book then about In Cold Blood, and you participated uh, with some other authors. Um, can you tell us about that? Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly. Well, I I had, of course, read the book anyway, and I there was a series called Critical Insights, which gathers together, published by Salem Press, which gathers together a range of essays from a variety of perspectives on various texts. And I was interested in doing that because I was interested in the book itself. I was interested in murder, partly through my interest in Colin Wilson, the ways in which you might uh, write about murder. Um, mm-hmm. So so I set out to do that. And I, I must stress that this was very much a, a joint effort that uh, all the mm-hmm. people who contributed to it offered all kinds of perspectives from a whole range of angles, literature, journalism, psychology, trauma theory, criminology, and and such like. And it's another reason, I think, in terms of why the book remains so fertile, is that it does have something to offer all of those uh, perspectives. So it's a question of of, uh, assembling the the essays um, Mm -hmm. uh, together. And it was a, a very interesting uh, and uh, to some extent harrowing process because it didn't mean constantly coming up against uh, the reality of this crime, the difference between true crime, if you like, and fictional crime. Mm-hmm. That's This This is the um, beginning of the true crime novel, at least that was that well known, that, that was Capote's contribution to literature as a, is what In Cold Blood was. Could we describe it that way? Yes, I, I think so to some extent. Um, there had been novels made on uh, base novels, that is, fictional novels based on real life crimes before. Um, for example, Theodore Dreiser's American Tragedy, published in 1925, or Mayor Levin's Compulsion, published in 1957, which was based on the Leopold and Lerb case, mm-hmm. which, uh, although Leopold and Lerb were much wealthier than Dick and Perry. It does have some similarities because you have the, the two criminals um, coming together again. But there'd, there'd be nothing, I think, quite like this. Uh, and nobody of quite that literary stature, I think, who had turned to this uh, writing about true crime. It was obviously you had these uh, 
lots of magazines say in the 1950s, I can remember them in England myself, like True Crime, True Detective. They were around in the 1930s too, because Colin Wilson uh, used to read all his mothers when she would get them in. But this was actually taking it into a different zone, I think, which has had a great subsequent influence on all kinds of uh, uh, crime, true crime writing. Mm -hmm. So what is it about this case that is so special? There's something very intriguing about it. Uh, so it's essentially a home invasion, robbery, yes. murder. There's yeah. something very special about it. What can you tell from just your research on it? What can you tell us? Well, I, I think there are several factors. Um, one is that the, the Clutters were a very successful, positive, uh, productive uh, family. Herb Clutter was a farmer, but he had been appointed by President Eisenhower to one of the federal farm boards. There's a very oh. interesting uh, interview with him in 1954, well before the murders took place in, in the New York Sunday Times magazine. And he reveals himself as a very thoughtful, intelligent uh, farmer. He'd been to Kansas State University, he had a degree, he ran his farm like a successful business, he was already active on it. And, the sense was, as, as indeed somebody said, somebody in Holcomb's so they, they, they were the last people to be, to be murdered. They, they were in some sense almost a, a perfect American family of, of the 1950s compared sometimes to families in a Norman Rockwell painting, for example. So I, th I think there was that sense. There was the, the shock of this invasion, both of the home and of the whole community. So I think that was that factor. And I think the the other elements, perhaps, that, that was particularly uh, intriguing is that there was a kind of disjunction between the apparent motive and what actually happened. This, this goes back to what you, you said earlier about Dick and Perry were under the misconception that there was a large amount of money on the premises. Ironically, as we know from the book, Herb Clutter, even in those days, very rarely paid by cash. Even for quite small amounts, he would use checks as it, it, much more an anticipation of how we uh, live now in a cashless society. So that, that was a particularly ironic factor. And uh -huh. it, of course, relates to the fact that Dick and Perry didn't really do their research very well. And you uh -huh. have the, the robbery was the ostensible motive for, for uh -huh. what they did. Uh -huh. But if they had been simply aiming to carry out a robbery, they wouldn't have needed to done the, do the murders. Um, mm -hmm. in, on one level, there's a very comic moment where they're heading towards uh, Holcomb and the Clutters, and it's suggested that they should get masks to cover their faces. And uh, Dick is actually sent into a convent uh, with the idea that he'll ask the nuns for some black stockings they can use as masks. And he, he, he comes back and he bottles out. He, he feels he can't do it. So that even that elementary precaution, they could have put masks on to get to be more careful about disposing of the boots that they used. And when they found out, as they and they did establish this quite early on, that there wasn't any money there, they could have just gone. And in certain moments, Perry Smith wanted to go, but they didn't. They went ahead with what were quite unnecessary murders in terms of achieving any objective of money that they had. And so I think one gets a sense of this, that the, the robbery was really the pretext. What they really wanted to do was to kill. And uh -huh. Dick in particular emphasizes this. He, he says, we, we must leave no witnesses. We must... He was a very uh, unpleasant phrase, spatter the walls with hair. In other words, blow people's heads off with a shotgun. So I, I think that too is very striking. But they're not like, um, for example, Leopold and Lerb, or the two other killers who came onto death row when Perry and Dick were there, York and Latham. Uh, I don't know if you know about this particular case, but York and Latham were two soldiers. One was 18, one was 19. And they embarked on a killing spree. They killed seven people, men, women, uh, before they ended up being convicted in Kansas and ended up on death row and eventually ended up being hanged. And when they were asked why, they said, oh, we, we hate the world. And they were just doing it for, for kicks, that kind of sensation. But in a uh -huh. sense, they, they were upfront about it. They weren't pretending to rob anyone. There was no financial benefit. It, it, the, the German term, the, the Lustner Morda, the, the murder that is done for joy, for kicks. And I think it's that sense that that's really 
on one level, if you look at them as robbers, they're, they're highly inefficient amateurs, terrible bunglers. But that's not really that wasn't really the point. And I think that that fascinates people too. How uh, what a, might have been an apparently banal robbery turns into this full scale murder, where they seem to be expressing some kind of general resentment of society of the world and, and it's, mm -hmm. it's it's shocking and as i say it links up with with um leopold and Lerb. it links up with york and latham it's that sense of a folly a deux a murder of two a shared psychosis mm -hmm. if you like uh, mm -hmm. that you get with them as well and i think that too is is compelling because you do you do get quite a strong sense when you read about them and um, both in, in Cold Blood and other material that's been made available, that um, left to themselves, neither one of them would have committed mm -hmm. a murder. Perry mm -hmm. Smith claims he's killed someone. He claims he's killed this African-American called King a few years ago. But there's a feeling he just, he's just boasting about that. And this, in fact, was investigated by the KBI, how I investigated it. He could find no evidence of that. Perry also claimed to have uh, thrown... Um, a man, sometimes as a policeman, off a bridge when he was in Japan, when he was in the USA. But but again, there's no evidence of this. And again, it sounds rather like boasting. Perry might not have killed if he hadn't met Dick. Dick, uh, uh, even more, would not have killed. One feels, you don't obviously you don't know, if he hadn't met Perry. So it was that, that folly mm -hmm. that combination that was so uh, startling and shocking. So the, the case kind of into uh, it, it, the nature of it makes us wonder about the psychology of sure. the perpetrators. Yes. And then there's this shocking element of this untouched um, Midwest American perfect sure. family yeah. now coming in contact with the worst elements in a, in a senseless crime. Yes, ab yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. It, it, it is that sense of senselessness that um, comes up. Uh, again and again, as you read it, the the, the, the disproportion between um, their ostensible robbery motive, they didn't end up with anything more than about $40 and a portable radio, and, and what they actually did. But I think, if, as I say, if one suggests that their real motive was to go on a, a killing spree, mm -hmm. then... Uh, and the, the robbery was just a kind of pretext for getting it going. And I think that becomes um, more understandable, perhaps, as far as anything like this can be, can be understood. And there's a, there's a social psychological factor of the, of the two of them coming together, um, making this happen. That, uh, yes. uh, um, would a case like this... Um, I don't know, in England or, or I wonder in the United States, would it even get beyond the local news in this day and age? Perhaps not. In, in I, I think it might still do because because of the victims, in fact. Uh -huh. In other words, if they if they had just, uh, let's say, killed a much poorer farming family or something like this, it, it might um, have attracted some attention, but not as much. It, it uh -huh. was the sense that they that they had picked the most pro or the almost the most prominent family in the district not quite the richest but perhaps almost the most prominent family in the district so so i think there was that that sense but i think also what one has to say of course one is probably much more used to through television social media and such like to mm -hmm. hearing about uh, crime now um, mm -hmm. Capote read about this, as I say, in, in the New York Times. Today, you'd be hearing about it on, on Twitter or Facebook, uh, mm -hmm. probably before anything else, and all kinds of comments would come in and you get all kinds of issues uh, uh, that arise around it. So, so we are in a, I suppose, in some sense, a more innocent age when certainly mm -hmm. murders did take place, but something like this was peculiarly shocking, yeah. And Capote, uh, with uh, Nell Harper Lee's help, then he became quite involved in the, it wasn't just writing about it. He went down there, met with the police, met, Absolutely. and ultimately met with the perpetrators themselves yes. while they're yes, in prison. Yes, he, he was very much involved in it. Uh, Harper Lee, it should be said, was probably very important to him uh, initially. Um, if you've ever seen Capote, he was this diminutive guy with this very high voice, very calm. 
And uh, he did know something about small town life, but he came from, but Harper Lee was important in smoothing the way for him. Uh, she was important in, in interviewing people, taking notes, all those elements, building a bridge for him to get to know the townsfolk. But Capote certainly went in there, and in particular, he got to know the leading KBI agent, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation agent, Alvin Dewey, a tall, rangy Texan, really, a, in many ways, a, an admirable all-American hero. And mm -hmm. he got close to Dewey. In fact, later on, Dewey and his wife and Capote became friends. You, you can see on YouTube various news reels of Capote taking them around New York and taking them sometimes <laughs> to fashionable parties. So he really, he really got to know uh, Dewey uh, well. Um, and so that, that and that was very important because it gave him privileged access to information. It's perhaps worth saying, however, that there has been some controversy after that that he overemphasized Dewey's prominent role. Okay. Dewey was an investigator, there's no doubt about that. But Harold Nye, for example, who was another KBI investigator, um, also made uh, some very important contributions. And it really was, if, if you look at it, and you, you can infer this from the book, it's quite emphasized in the 1996 film that this was police teamwork that did investigative teamwork that, mm -hmm. that tracked down, eventually mm -hmm. tracked down the killers and also got them, very important, got them to confess when yes. questioning them separately. But then you're right, he did get to know the killers. Um, he felt, and I think this is fairly well known, it comes across in, in both the film about Capote and the film also about Capote called Infamous, uh, made respectively in 2005. Uh, I, have not, I have not seen that one. I've, say, I've seen uh, Capote. I think it was yes, 2006 uh, you referenced. Yes, Infamous so came soon after. It's, it's interesting. It's got an English actor called Toby Jones uh, playing. Okay. The part. He does it somewhat differently, but he does it quite well. And um, so you, you have those two films which are about Capote himself. And he, he got... He, he identified to some extent with Perry Smith. Um, mm -hmm. Capote too had had a very neglected childhood. He'd been left, uh, uh, his parents weren't actually crawled to him, but they just weren't bothered about him. He got left alone in hotel rooms with a door lock, for, his, for example, from the age of about two. Um, Perry Smith had also had a very bad childhood. He'd been abused in, in various ways. They were both rather diminutive, um, mm -hmm. but biologically, um, Smith as a result of a motorbike accident he had that had shattered his legs. And Capote mm -hmm. felt that a kind of there, but for the grace of God, I might have gone in that direction. Mm -hmm. And of course, things became very fraught yeah. because there was a feeling in some quarters, there was a notorious attack by uh, a rather acerbic English uh, theatre and book critic called Kenneth Tynan that suggested that Capote hadn't really done enough to try to help, particularly Smith, to secure a, a reprieve. And it's been suggested, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a definitive judgment on this, and it's it's been suggested that Capote didn't do that because he knew that the best way to end the book would be with a hanging or two hangings. Mm -hmm. uh, was the movie, uh, at least the Capote movie, accurate that uh, he helped get them uh, a new attorney that would help them file appeals and they got a stay of execution? Uh, at least for they, they, they did get several stays of execution and uh -huh. he, um, he did help them to some extent. But when, as time progressed, he, his, um, attachment to them and particularly to perry became more more remote and, mm -hmm. and there is he didn't perhaps do if you one feels that he should have done something to try to people he didn't do uh, as much as perhaps he might have done uh, mm -hmm. that 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 is the the, the the feeling but he certainly helped them early on and of course he helped them in another way because a lot of what they did when they were in prison was writing Dick became a great student when he wasn't reading Harold Robbins' paperbacks of the law, and he, he would go through law books. He would um, then write appeals, write to uh, government agencies, write to lawyers to try and secure a reprieve. And Perry, of course, wrote a great deal. He also drew a great deal. Another point about them is that when they were assessed by the, um, the various psychiatrists, 
um, it was said that uh, that both of them were of above average intelligence and okay. certainly had artistic leanings. It doesn't, of course, excuse what they did, but it is nonetheless significant of this kind of murderer, the kind of murderer that Colin Wilson was interested in. They're not stupid or mindless, generally speaking. They, they had these considerable uh, abilities. And even if you look at Dick's career as a, as a con man, when he's hanging paper, passing these dud checks all the time, it's clear he was, in fact, very skillful at this. He could get people to like him. He could get people to take. He could get people to believe him. He could take them in. So mm -hmm. uh, again, you get that sense of they, they had abilities that one wishes they might have used in some more positive way. And that too, I think, adds to the the, the poignancy of the whole event. They, sh they just shouldn't have been killing people. Uh, so, uh, and, and that was Smith that had those kind of con man, con man type um, manipulative. That was, that was, that was, that was Dick. He, he was, oh, he was yeah, he, he was the con man. Um, uh -huh. What what they would do, they, they do it after the murders on several occasions. They would go into um, shops. This is quite well showed in some of the films. And he would say, uh, for example, there's, there's one where he, he says to the assistant, look, I'm with this guy, Perry Smith. This little guy here, he's getting married. He needs a new suit, you see. So let's yeah. try and fit him out with a suit. And Dick says, well, I'm going to have a, need a new suit too. And so he gets the suit as well. And then he goes to pay. He says, ah, this is before the age of credit cards, of course. Ah, I haven't got, I haven't got enough cash with me, uh, but I can write you a check. And, yeah. and, and he was successful in, in doing this. Perry would watch him with fascination. Yeah. And so he, he hung paper um, quite a lot of the time. Um, so, so in in that respect, he, he, if you can talk about a successful criminal, he was. But he wasn't. He wasn't a big time criminal. In fact, so so you, th there's that interesting element too. So Hickok had the kind of the the classic sociopathic tendencies of uh, being a liar, being a criminal. Yes. And, and, and Perry Smith's personality, we could describe. How so? Because I, I know from the 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 film uh, Capote with Philip Seymour Hoffman, he was uh, he kind of got close to Perry, and he yes. was with the two of them all the way up to their execution. Yes, yeah, yes, he comes uh, on to the execution. Yeah, and, and so they kind of portrayed Perry Smith as uh, I don't know uh, if that's the right word, but the more sensitive of the two, or uh, you know, a little more uh, maybe emotionally complex. I guess you could say. Yes. Yes. I, 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 yeah, I think, I think that's right. He, he was, as you say, more sensitive. He had artistic aspirations. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a picture of Christ he drew, for example, that a priest who was seeing him was very moved uh, and, and affected by. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, Dick, yes, was, was more of a, a, a classic, uh, uh, sociopath in many ways. Um, we should also, since it's mentioned, add, add paedophilia to his uh, his uh -huh. uh, crime list. He he was he although he'd actually been married twice and had had children, he could not settle down to any kind of normal uh, family life. So yes, uh -huh. he, he was a sociopath. Though it's also important to say, and part of the reason why he can be so disturbing, and both the both the movies of Incorporate bring this out, he could also be very charming. Mm -hmm. um, but Perry was the more sensitive one, but he was also arguably the more dangerous figure. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things it suggested is that they, te one of the reasons they teamed up, one of the reasons that Dick teamed up with Perry is, is that Dick saw that Perry could carry out the killings he couldn't himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he felt Perry could do this. And, and so, He's a fascinating character, but he has got this this tough side. He may not have killed anybody, but he'd been in the U.S. Army. He'd been in Japan. He'd got a gold star. He'd been court-martialed on at least one occasion for breaking up a Japanese bar. He would probably be the, the more dangerous, uh, although he was rather shorter, he'd probably be the more dangerous figure to meet in a fight than Dick, where you feel he would quite soon back down. So, but I think the contrast you draw is, is, is absolutely right between a more sociopathic Dick and a more sensitive Perry, but also a very dangerous Perry if he was roused. His, his father said that uh, when he got into a fight, he was like a buzzsaw 
And I suspect mm-hmm. that's probably true. And as I say, he would be the truly dangerous one. And there's still, it, it should be said, there's still some debate about who actually carried out the murders. Mm-hmm. Harry seems to have taken the rap for them all. He did them all. That's that's essentially his claim. There is another account, supposedly written by Dick, in which he says he did at least two of them. We we don't we don't quite know um, what, the, what the case is. Again, it's the case of them sparking off each other. But certainly, there was a sense that Dick had that Perry could kill more easily than Dick could, and, and that too is goes back to the folly adder, the, the the two people who come together who might not have killed otherwise and striking this lethal chemistry. Mm-hmm. If I may, um, yes. it says in, so your book is, is critical insights. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about uh, in critical insights in code blood. Yeah. Uh, it is a tightly concentrated, finely honed work that within its uh, comparatively compact compass contains multitudes and ventures into the most dangerous territory with disturbing aplomb. Yes. The yes. wide-ranging collection of in-depth original essays probes into a variety of aspects of the book itself, the critical responses to it, its mm-hmm. cinematic adaptations, yeah. and the many literary, cultural, ethical, psychological, and philosophical issues that it raises. Yes. And you, yeah. you, you point out uh, David Hayes um, yeah. Uh, yeah. poses a question, why does In Cold Blood remain a classic? It's still admired by so many nonfiction writers. Mm-hmm. It's taught in schools, translated into more than 30 languages, yes. made into four movies, and still among the best selling true crime books ever published. Yes. So that's, uh, what would you say? What would you say about that? So that's kind of like this uh, the social psychological aspects of it, the, the, uh, the, the social dynamic of it. All these things make it so popular after all these years. I think they do. I mean, I, I think one probably has to start by saying that it's, it's, in my view, but I think in the view of most people who read it, it is very well written. It's uh, Capote, as I s- said toward the beginning, was had established himself as an accomplished um, novelist, and particularly an accomplished short story writer, writing for The New Yorker, where you have to create a situation, you have to hook the reader's interest in your first paragraph or so, otherwise they're not going to be interested in publishing you. And he brought those skills to this real life uh, crime in In Cold Blood. He uses um, cinematic techniques, you could say, which the films tend to follow, uh, of cross-cutting. So you you cut between the clutters, and Dick and Perry on their way to kill the Clutters. And he keeps doing that throughout the novel. When the Clutters are dead, he, he's cut in between the KBI agents like Dewey and Nye and Dick and Perry. And then it's not until quite near the end of the novel that he finally describes the killing itself. Mm-hmm. So the, you have that that structural element that makes it so um, powerful, and also Capote's prose is is very good. In the kind of way I mentioned in relation to his short stories, it plunges you into these different situations, these different settings. So you're in the Clutter's house, you're in the Clutter's minds, then you're in Dick and Perry's house, you're in Dick and Perry's minds, you're in Alvin Jr.'s house with his wife, and you're in Alvin's mind. So it goes on like that. So it's a very, very absorbing narrative. So, so it, it all starts, I think, from there. It, it's also the case that it has, and this is a point David Hayes makes, uh, because he's an award-winning uh, journalist himself, that it set a kind of precedent for true crime writing. And um, a lot of those were followed in his footsteps, including, I suppose, Norman Mailer, who was probably the quickest to follow with the Executioner's Song about, about Gary Gilmore. Mm-hmm. And it, it showed how it could be done. In other words, if you want to write a nonfiction book about a crime, you use the techniques of the novelist. That is, you use dialogue, you go into people's minds, and this can be dodgy. Uh, mm-hmm. one, one of the key controversies over In Cold Blood is that Capote made the rather rash claim that, claim that it was 100% truth. He, he made this claim that he, the figure varies, that he trained himself to remember conversations so he could remember 94 or 97% of what people actually said. 
And anybody who's ever done interviews knows that this is a, a, a very rash claim. And um, of course, very quickly after the book had appeared, um, there were articles pointing out all the discrepancies in it. And what, of course, you get now, and you can see it very common now in films based on some kind of true crime. They will say based on a true story. They will say some incidents have been fictionalized. And, and that's a, a useful disclaimer that Capote didn't make. In terms of, of the issues it touches on, it, it clearly does come back to that most fundamental issue of why people kill and also why they might kill when there's no obvious motive, like trying to get a lot of money or a cream passionnel, a crime of passion out of jealousy. Why are people killing, apparently, uh, for the, the fun of it? So it's that fundamental question. And then it also raises further questions about, uh, is there any way in which one can possibly atone or compensate the, the relatives of the victims. There's the issue of what you then do with the criminals themselves. Uh, do you execute them? Do you keep them in prison? Do you let them linger for a long time uh, before executing them? All those all those questions as well. And the, the other point perhaps also worth, worth making about in Pogba is quite significant is uh, to what extent can a, a psychological explanation that is convincing be, be made. How, how do you explain this? One of the crucial things about In Cold Blood, the way it works, is that because of the, the law situation in Kansas at this time, lengthy psychiatric testimony was not allowed. Um, uh -huh. They were simply asked, the, the psychiatrist was simply asked to say whether he thought that Dick and Perry could tell the difference between right and wrong. Um, legally, not necessarily morally, but could, did they know what they were doing was against yeah, the yeah. law? And of course, the, the, the psychiatrist answered yes, as he had to. They clearly did. It was it, the, the McNaughton rules, which were established in England in the 19th century, which you would have to know about, were, were, were therefore being used. But what Capote does is to is to say he, the psychiatrist was not allowed to testify, but if he had testified, he might have said. And, and so therefore you get you, you do get in the novel, which you wouldn't get if you were, for example, reading the court transcripts, various psychological perspectives on uh, Dick and Perry. The, the novel doesn't really come down on one side or the other. It leaves the reader free to decide or to indeed devise another explanation. But you, you get those there too. And then, of course, the whole set of issues, as I say, around capital punishment. So it, it actually it succeeds as a novel, both in being a compelling read, but also concentrating all these issues, which of course are still very much debated today. Capital punishment is still hotly debated today. How far you should allow an excuse of insanity to, to mean that somebody should be exculpated from murder is still a large issue today. So, so it's, it's very much ongoing. And I think that's another reason it touches lots of contemporary nerves. By contemporary, I mean 21st century nerves, 2020 nerves. Yeah, the United States had the the, uh, the McNaughton rule, and uh, depending on which state you're in, about oh, yes. we, yeah. we may have the American Legal Institute uh, rule. You know, could you conform your behavior to the law? And then there's a nice. there's older rules about oh, would you would you have committed the crime if a police officer was right there? Oh, that's uh, an interesting one. Uh, it's, it's, it's a comparison, so it's kind of like uh, yeah. What, how do you insanity? How do you know? what someone was thinking or how they were able to, to you know, comport their behavior to any particular sure. set of events. Yes, 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 absolutely. So, I mean, that that is still very, very much an ongoing question. And I, I think one of the things also, continuing with this insanity and crime and punishment issue, is that when Dick and Perry were on uh, death row, there were other people on death row with them. And so it constitutes, in a grim kind of way, a kind of laboratory in which you can look at why people might have done what they did. So you've got Dick and Perry, you've got York and Latham, whom I mentioned earlier, who killed seven people. It's interesting your point about the states, because they'd done this in several different states. And uh, the different states were actually vying to try and... Uh, capture them and execute them. Of course, it would have been different methods in different states, electrocution in some, lethal injection in other, hanging, of course, in, in canvas. And the other grimly fascinating figure who was on death row was a young man 
called Lowell Lee Andrews. And Andrews was a huge man, a kind of gentle giant, he seemed to be, who one evening um, was reading Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov in his uh, room. He shaved, put his suit on. He went downstairs and he shot first his sister, then his father, then his mother dead. And he made various appeals, but eventually he he too was hung. And th that, that again, you, it raises the question, is somebody who does that crazy? Well, yes, obviously, in, in any sense. Again, it doesn't seem there was any particular motive for it. And um, so you, you have those comparisons. You have Dick and Perry, you have York and Latham, you have Lowell, Lee, Andrews, and they're all together in death row. In fact, um, York and Latham were the last people to be executed by hanging in, Cam in Kansas in the 20th century. So, so the, the death row scenes, which are harrowing in a way, but they're also very compelling. And they really do put you up against this question of why somebody would do this and what, what on earth can be done with people who have done this. So uh, Andrews was reading Brothers Karamazov, not yes. Crime and Punishment. Yeah, yeah, yes. He he was a he was a, a well-read young man, and he continued to to read when he was in prison. He was an example, in fact, going back to Colin Wilson of a Colin Wilson outsider. But his the direction he took was destructive of others and of, of himself. It, it, it's extremely difficult to explain. It wasn't a situation. You get, of course, domestic violence where um, uh, uh, one member of a family kills another, but there wasn't any sense in this case of any um, overt tensions in the family. So he too is a compelling figure. And I, I think another strength of In Cold Blood is the way in which Capote offers you the case histories of these people and he evokes them for you. Uh, there's a very powerful scene where Dick and Perry watch Andrews, they can just see out of their cell, they watch him being taken to the warehouse, the corner as it's called, which is where uh -huh. the executions take place. So as I said, I think that, that too is, is another element of the novel which makes it very powerful, but also makes you ask a lot of questions and it enter into a lot of debates. Um, in one of the writers, uh, Torsten Peterson's essay yes. acknowledges the multiplying criticisms of In Cold Blood's departure from fact, as we mentioned, yeah. which yes. have become more strident in the 21st century, but argues that while the book fails as a reliable factual account, it succeeds as a novel, as a literary work. Yes, I, I, I think that, that, that is true. Um, that, that, that is the case. It does, it does undoubtedly succeed as a literary work for the reasons that I've suggested. At the same time, um, one can say, I think, uh, David Hayes says this, for example, that it, it isn't quite enough that because it's being offered as, if not 100% truth, largely true, you feel you need to trust it a bit more. And it's worth noting that, that Alvin Dewey, uh, who, uh, as I said, got very close to, to Capote, said that he agreed that there were inaccuracies. And there's an invented chapter right at the end where Susan Kidwell, who was Nancy's friend, um, meets Dewey in the uh, graveyard in Holcomb. And that seems to be entirely invented. But Dewey nonetheless thought that it was essentially true, as he said. Of course, Agent Nye, who said he had not been given sufficient credit in the investigation thought rather differently. But yes, I think it does succeed as a novel. At the same time, I don't think you can quite read it as just as a novel, because it is true. And, and of course, there are people who are still alive. Bobby Rupp, who was uh, Nancy's girlfriend, who, as I mentioned, was an initial suspect who was interrogated by uh, the, the KBI, is still alive. He still mm -hmm. lives in Holcomb. He's married to someone else. He's got children, but he still regularly places flowers on Nancy's grave. Mm -hmm. The other members of the Clutter family who are still alive. You've also got uh, Dick's children. I mentioned he, he was married and a father a couple of times. Okay. Uh, maybe grandchildren who are still still around. So so yeah. it, it, I, I was very conscious of this in writing it, that there are all these sensitivities of people who are still living and um, around. And I think other people were, were as well. Um, so so I, I think that while it does succeed as a novel, you've also got to 
um, be aware of the fact that it's being presented as truth and be aware of the fact that it, there may be other stories or other accounts that need now to be taken into consideration. Uh, one, of, one of the essays, um, I'm, I'm looking for it here, but it's asking the question, is a, is a completely factual presentation of a story like this in this form even really possible? Because it seems like you have to you have to portray the the feeling, the emotion, the sure. context of it in a certain way. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yes, I I, I, I think that's true. I think that um, the, the essay you mentioned was, I think, making the point that what um, Capote does is he tries to blend two genres. He tries to blend a nonfiction account of the murders with a novel, and that's. Of course, very effective in the ways I've suggested. It gets you into the situations, it gets you into the characters, but you're almost inevitably bound to make things up to a, a greater or lesser extent. Not not maliciously, but if you're thinking back on what what might, for example, the clutters have been saying to each other on the evening of their murder before before the murders arrived, and Capote even if he had a tape recorder and actually been there, could never have been that accurate. So yes, I, I think I think they are uh, incompatible. If if you make the claim, as Capote rather rashly did, that you're offering 100% truth, if you make the kind of claim that you often find now in um, novels and films, which says that uh, this is based on a true story, uh, then you you get out of it but i think i think you you're never going to um get away from that but the, the question would be would you would you ever actually be able to produce an immaculately factual to use the term to quote himself used, account of any of anything um because you're always going to be looking at it from a particular viewpoint your your information is never going to be complete and so I think it's very difficult, even if you're writing a completely documentary account. And there could be an argument. It's, it's best to say, yeah, not all of this is true. Sometimes I'm guessing. Sometimes I'm speculating. This, this is what Norman Mailer says in relation to the armies of the night, for example, that uh, he knows that this isn't necessarily all going to be true. But his imaginative intuition might will enable him to uh, penetrate to the heart of things in a way a documentary account might not. Again, you're, you're in your own dodgy ground i think when you say that but it may be inevitable we had a previous guest who had the uh, a book called crime exploitation which focuses on uh, some of the television shows some of the specials um that kind of media that may be exploiting uh criminal cases just for their shock value for their yes. emotion yeah. and i had not even thought about literature do you think there's a danger, and even in cold blood, does it exploit cases like this and and do some kind of harm? I think there, there is undoubtedly a danger of that. I think one could even argue that the better written a novel is, the more dangerous it is because it's it's more convincing. Um, certainly, um, we know that the the remaining Clutter family, because they weren't all killed, there were two grown up daughters who were living away. They, they are still alive, I believe. And they, of course, were very upset uh, by the book um, because mm. they felt the portrayal of their father uh, was inaccurate. And um, they have been very averse to, to giving any interviews about it. They did finally involve themselves quite recently in making a documentary and creating a kind of scrapbook for their family, which was designed to show the more positive side of, of the Clutters. So yes, I think it's there. The only thing I would say, I think it's been since the birth of journalism in say in England in the 18th century, and probably earlier, there is a keen interest in true crime. People mm -hmm. write about it, they write ballads about it, they're fascinated by it. Uh, a lot of English literature, Defoe's Mole Flanders, for example, deals with people who are, are, are criminals. So there is that general fascination there, but clearly today, the, the nature of the, or the media we have today makes that exploitation much harder. And it must be, of course, extremely painful for anyone who has literally been involved in mm -hmm. this kind of event one way or another to mm -hmm. be aware of all that that is going on. As I say, I was conscious of that. In, in compiling the book and, and putting mm. it together, it did concern me 
Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I felt that the interest in it, this is the, of course, the usual justification, the the public interest was so great that uh, it might be useful for people to be better informed about all the possibilities, including, and this is quite well emphasized in many parts of the collection, including all those ways it does depart uh, from fact, or does seem to give a misleading impression of the various characters. But but that, 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 uh, of course, uh, applies to others too, right? I think quite recently, uh, a descendant, I think, of um, Joseph Douglas Latham, one of the two killers I mentioned who were on death row, she says, well, these, this, there was, a, a, I believe, a dramatization of this on the TV. She said it gives a completely inaccurate impression okay. of, uh, of what uh, he was actually like. So that's always going to happen because people have different subjective viewpoints. Mm-hmm. So, but the, the exploitation, yes, I think that's a real... A real mm-hmm issue and it's particularly an issue today at the same time i think it's very very difficult to stop even with very heavy censorship even in the communist countries or the old soviet union there was still a keen interest in crime and information and news about it circulated even when you had heavy censorship and, and why why is such an interest uh, in crime that's gone on for so long and it's uh, it's in so many different uh, so many different areas now, um, some of a high quality, some maybe not so high quality, uh, because I've had true crime uh, writers before and, and I've asked them about, you know, what do you think, where's the interest come from in true crime? Yeah, yes, yeah. I, I think um, one one might make a distinction between types of crime. I think if you're talking about murder, uh, that's the ultimate transgression in Western culture, it goes back to the Bible, the story of Cain and Abel. It's one of the first signs of the world after the fall. There's something very, there's something very fundamental about it. No society has not had a prohibition against murder. They may allow killing in certain circumstances in, in war, for example, but it seems to be a universal taboo. And I think with other kinds of crime, um, let's take financial fraud, for example, because there's been quite a lot of films and documentaries and such about that. I, I think, again, there's the fascination of transgression. There's the fascination, perhaps also in that respect, of perhaps seeing someone who in some ways is beating the system in, in a certain kind of way. So I, I think it's you could perhaps put it under the general rubric of transgression, say that there's something exciting, fascinating, interesting about it even for people or perhaps especially for people who would never dream of doing such a thing in their everyday lives there's if you think in terms of fiction there's the popularity i don't know if they use this category in in the states but in england they they use the category for novels like agatha christie dorothy o says detectives of cozy crime and there's this <laughs> idea that you settle down in, in your safe house so there's not a home invasion and you read about murder uh-huh. So, no, it is, it's, it's, it's a primal thing, um, murder being the ultimate transgression, but the other kinds of transgression being interesting as well. The, the confidence trickster, for example, is a fascinating uh, figure, I, I think, in both the States and in England. There's a TV series in England called Hustle, the film called American Hustle, uh, that there. And, and there's a fascination with seeing how it's, how it's done, the skills that are brought to bear. And for, uh, you know, I was just thinking when you were talking earlier about Colin Wilson, he talked a lot of uh, kind of Maslowian uh, yes, yes. patterns in crime of yes. ages ago. They may commit out of economic necessity for resources. Sure. And then in, in more and more in modern eras, uh, committing crime for the purpose of self-esteem. Sure. sure. Uh, and that I wonder if the, uh, if the clever murders in light of talking about this, was related to self-esteem as a motive. I, I think it was. I, I think um, Capote himself said something. He said it about Perry. He's, he said, you can't go on going through life forever without getting anything you want. And there was the sense that Perry, who had dreams of being a successful musician, performing at Las Vegas, had really not got anything he wanted. So the crime was a way of establishing himself, as it was for Dick. It's a way, it's perhaps a terrible thing to say, but it's a way of achieving a kind of 
immortality. We would never be talking uh, about Dick Hickok and Perry Smith if they had not conducted those killings. And there's certainly a sense that Dick, for example, certainly felt in, in something he wrote himself that he that he was going to go through with this killing because this would put him on the map whatever happened afterwards and that in a twisted way is precisely the maslovian idea of of self-esteem you try uh -huh. to achieve self-esteem in this way and of course you 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 don't in various ways but you do achieve a, a reputation our fascination if we go back to that our fascination with the murderer um, sometimes to the exclusion of a concern for the victim, which is still quite, quite strong. And uh, ethically, it's appalling in a way, but I think it's also it's also understandable. But I think that kind of analysis you mentioned, Colin Wilson, Abraham Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, once you've got food and everything else, you need self-esteem, is, is yeah. a good way of looking at what Dick and Perry did. And I think... Wilson's attitude was, was interesting because when he first went in cold blood, he, he wasn't all that impressed, but he came greatly to admire it. And I think he admired it because he could see that it was, in some sense, showing murderers who fitted the kinds of patterns he'd he'd outlined. And, and time and again, you, you do feel with Dick and Perry, or I do anyway, that I, I wish uh -huh. they'd gone straight. I wish they'd got a proper job where they could have uh, uh, found some outlet for their uh, varied abilities, which, are, as I suggested earlier, were quite considerable. There's no reason, in a way, why they couldn't have made a success in various fields in the world. But they wanted uh -huh. to do more. And it's another point Wilson makes that they took a shortcut to it that crime and particularly murder is a shortcut to try and achieve an intensity and a reputation that otherwise might take years and years to to attain uh, be behaviorally um I, I, when i think about this case I, th I think about what i've said about uh, maybe the rise of serial murder and other kinds yeah. of what we see as bizarre murder in the years since is uh yeah. Part of it is the rise of the interstate highway system and all yes. the features of modern society yeah. that provide opportunity. So yes. in, in a sense, I wonder if uh, Capote's writing was a little bit prescient about this is a changing world. That we're going to have things that we never even imagined before, and some of it will yes. shock us because yes. the context of the world has changed. And yes. now we're going to have a different kind of criminal. Yes, yes, I, I think so. I think I, th I think what you've said there is another good reason for its durability, that it is prescient, that it does see things that um, would become much more common. And your, your point about interstate highways is very interesting, because, of course, one of the key things about In Cold Blood is the contrast between the settled world of the farm and Perry and Dick bowling along these interstate highways, which of course on one level is very exciting. It's the American, I've hitchhiked around America and I know this, the American uh -huh. pioneering spirit traveling through those enormous uh, landscapes. But of course it does also make it uh, more possible to do something and flee from the scene of the crime uh -huh. rather than the crime that's committed within a local community. And, and you could say, yes, you could say it anticipates our world where we can move very quickly about the globe and all kinds of things uh, can, can happen in all kinds of, of places. And the, the increase in the crime that's conducted purely for sensation. So perhaps there's a terrible sense that uh, Dick and Perry, uh, for example, or York and Latham were prototypes that uh -huh. um, were followed. And of course, it's, it's also possible, particularly now, and this is perhaps another significant factor, for people to go on the internet and read in detail about uh -huh. these crimes. So it's the, the copycat factor, if you like. So there might be someone somewhere now reading about Dick and Perry. It's a horrific thought, but nonetheless thinking, hey, that's a way to put myself on the map. And now we have criminals that can commit their crimes live on a live stream. And yes, broadcast. you're quite right. That's a very good point too. Too yes, and you, gosh, yes, you you feel that Dick and Perry might quite have liked to do that. That would have been Perry's big moment. So yes, that 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 is your an absolutely uh, chilling but compelling factor as well. And again, I I would agree with you that I think you could see that anticipated in uh, Capote's in Cold Blood, and that, that is uh, a key reason for the why we're still reading it, apart from the other elements that I've mentioned. I, I want to...
quickly, I'll say that among the essays that you've included in here, yes. uh, Bloodlines, Ethnicity, and Otherness in Cold yes. Blood. Yes. If you want to say anything about that? Yes, sure. Um, I think that um, one, of the, one of the points that um, Capote makes early on is that the uh, population of Holcomb, uh, it contains Norwe people of Norwegian, Swedish, German, and even Japanese origin, in fact. So in a sense, it's, it's living up to the Am American ideal of the melting pot. All these people are getting together. They have a common commitment to the American way of, of life. Then you've got a sense of people coming from the outside, like Dick and Perry. There's a very interesting moment where um, one local person says he's seen these two, he saw these two Mexicans hanging around um, Herbert Clutter's house. The police investigate this and they, they can't find any evidence for it. And, but in a sense, it would be a relief against the community if it did come outside the, the two Mexicans in, in, in that sort of way. The a uh, portrayal of the, the Japanese family uh, is quite interesting. Um, and it's one of the things I discussed because it's not that long after all, after Pearl Harbor. It's not that long after Japanese civilians mm -hmm. interned in, in camps. And yet by this time, you, you get this fully integrated family whom Herb pays tribute to at one of the local associations of, of which he is chairman. So you've got this society that seems to be fitted together very well, but you've also got this sense of others coming in from the outside, or where did Dick and Perry try to escape to? They try to escape to Mexico. They don't actually last very long there, but that's where they, they can't really probably back to America, in fact, which is one of the reasons they get caught, one of the reasons for their absurd inefficiency, in a sense. But again, you, you get that sense of a kind of ethnic otherness. So I think I think that that's an interesting element uh, there. Mm -hmm. Uh, questions left hanging the 1996 film of In Cold Blood. I think that was, yeah. it was a television film. Is that it right? A, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a t yeah, it was a television film. Yes, it was therefore rather longer than the, the original uh -huh. feature film, which uh, Capote very much admired the original film, but he said it should have been nine hours long. The, <laughs> um, the, the second film, the 1996 film, wasn't nine hours long, but it was rather longer. And it, it's, I think the, the original film is very good. I'll say that first of all. As the, the original film, film was, I think it had Robert Blake. It had Robert uh, Blake. Yes, yes, yeah. he would later uh, stand trial for murder himself in late life. Yeah. Uh, but he, he gave a superb performance. Indeed, Capote said when he first met Blake, it was uncanny because he thought, yes, this is just like Perry Smith. Okay. Uh, so you have that. It, it was deliberately shot in black and white. It was a neo noir film. Most films like Body and Clyde, for example. But in 67 were made in colour, so it was going back to that retro mode, looking like a forced film. Very good. The 1996 film, since you asked specifically about that, was made for television. It's rather um, longer. Uh, it is a, a fascinating film in a whole range of respects. One of the things it does that is not in the earlier film is that it does from the start emphasise what is also very important in the book, which is that both Dick and Perry suffer from some form of disfigurement, a physical impairment. There's a description in the book, which I think was actually written, originally written by Harper Lee, that when you look at Dick's face, it's divided into two halves. Now, everybody's face is divided into two halves to some extent if you look at them. But in Dick's case, after a motor accident, so it looks as if it's been split in two and put back in perfectly together. Mm -hmm. And in the novel, this sense is... Uh, in the, I beg your pardon, in the 1996 film, this is emphasised by the fact that we have a close upon a kind of scar below Dick's eye. Uh, in the earlier film, um, where Scott Wilson plays the, the role, it, there isn't that. He he looks fine, but you're you're immediately made aware that Dick has this rather sinister element in his face. Simply, there's a shot again in an early scene of Perry sitting on the bed uh, with his undershorts on, and you can see his legs, and you can see how badly damaged they've been from the motorbike accident. So that that is uh, an, an element that is in the book that is not in the first film, but is in the second film. And there's, of course, a, both a real and symbolic implication that these are figures who have been physically as well as psychologically damaged. 
Uh, one other interesting element I'll mention is towards the end of the film, which relates to my title for that essay, Questions Left Hanging. In the book, Capote describes Dewey being present at the executions, but he says that when Perry was executed, Dewey closed his eyes. Mm. Dewey denies this. Mm -hmm. No, we can't adjudicate. But, uh, of course, Capote has suggested that in some way he was affected, sensitive to Perry's death in a way he wasn't to Dix. What they do in the film is he has his hat on and his brim is down. And it shadows his eyes. So you can't actually see whether he closes his eyes or not. And that is actually, I think, very skillful because there's an ambiguity over the truth of the book itself. Did uh -huh. Dewey close his eyes? If so, what did it mean? Did he uh -huh. not close his eyes, but Dewey wanted him to close his eyes? So I, th I think, in other words, it's a film made with an awareness that Capote's account can't wholly be trusted. Mm -hmm. um... Uh, Perry was uh, shaking Dewey's hand um, as he was yes, led up to the gallows. And, and Dick, yes, yes. I mean, they, they, uh -huh. they, they, they were impressed um, by Dick's bearing. Uh, Agent Nye said this. He, he, he figured the guy for a coward, but th there wasn't any sense of this. I suppose you could say, in a way, for both of them, it was their big moment. It was the culmination of all they'd done. And, and certainly Nick, uh, uh, Dick, uh, showed himself to be a, a brave at the moment of, it, of his execution. Nothing became his life like the leaving of it, as he said in that. <laughs> and and uh -huh. yeah, and that, that comes across again, it's, it's, it comes across in the film. Uh, one, one of the, the striking things, I think, about both films, in fact, but particularly the Nine Down Exits film, is it does bring across both how terrifying it was but also how likable he was. This is why he was such a good con man. It's also why he could seduce underage girls uh, and mm -hmm. such like. So um, that, that comes across effectively. I, I like the, the film Capote, where they would kind of juxtapose Capote's uh, New York uh, kind of pretentious cocktail party life. <laughs> And then go back to the uh, go cut back again and again. They cut back to Kansas. The investigation. Yes, they kind of had a gray look to it. I like the yes. the contrast there. Yes, yes, I think I think I think that was very very effective, and it does convey a reality that although Capote had actually, as I say, come from a very small town in the South, not wholly unlike Holcomb, that's obviously a different part of America. He'd become very successful in New York, part of the the glitterati, the literati, but then. He'd gotten back to do this. And although he still kept his New York identity, you got the sense that he was really always thinking about what was happening in Kansas, partly because he was writing the book about it, partly because it, it obsessed him in, in certain ways. Well, uh, we've gone well over an hour and it seems like it's flown by because there's just so much to talk about. So, yes. uh, Critical Insights in Cold Blood. Yes, that's right. Yes. Published by Salem Press. Yeah. By Salem Press. You are the editor along with many that's authors on here. Yes, that, that's right. Yes. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, we'll have a link. I encourage people to read it. It's fascinating. I, yeah. I, I enjoy this kind of thing about, yeah. uh, about a particular book and a particular case. Thank um, you. Yes. You, you're going to write anything like that in the future, you think? I'm not sure. Um, what one result of the the book is that there's quite a lot left over that I might like to say and that I might like to investigate. And I, in some sense, I'll I'll see what happens. It's not impossible that I might f feel like writing a book entirely of my own uh, about uh, about Capote and particularly about In Cold Blood. But it's certainly an interest that will. Uh, uh, continue. Um, I should say my, my wife, too, who, who wrote the biographical essay, also became extremely interested in Capote uh, and in the, the, the whole um, in cold blood phenomenon of the books and the films, though it's made us extremely careful always to check that we've locked the door firmly at night now. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's it. No, no longer days where everybody leaves their doors uh, unlocked absolutely and th this was one of the things with with herb of course he'd left his door unlocked when dick and perry arrived they didn't have to force an entry they could just get in they just walked in they just walked in 
thank you so much for uh, being sure. part. Uh, and uh, it, we'll be in touch in the future, and maybe Certainly. someday we'll have another Colin Wilson conference. That would be good. I, I hope we could do that. Thank you very much for, for your very intelligent and interesting questions and for the opportunity to talk at length about this uh, book and the whole in cold blood phenomenon. Thank you, and thanks to all the authors of the book. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Have a great day, Nicholas. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. All the rest. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.